Welcome to Earth and Pulse. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, I'll do a real quick introduction, Randy, and then I'm going to pretty much hand it over to you. Oh, I want to wow. <laughs> I I introduce you to Jeffrey Sewell. You both, neither of you have met before. That's true. Um, Jeffrey's really last big marathon presentation was on the same subject we're going to be talking about today, which is the uh, uh, predatory parasitical aspect of artificial intelligence. And uh, Jeffrey has a website called cytocosmos.com. Uh, he's known as the metabiologist. And uh, he'll be bringing in some uh, views of metabiology. We did such a marathon with Alfred Lambert Weather that we went 10 hours. Uh, right. Maybe today we can bring it into some really sharp focus here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really important when we talk about something like artificial intelligence, quantum computing. Uh, the aspects of what's happening on our internet right now, that we also present solutions. Um, so I'm Christine uh, of Earth Impasse, Claudia Ayaz of Earth Impasse, and Randy Moggins, you're the man of Off Planet Radio. <laughs> no, actually, I'm probably, probably the least among my, my peers here in terms of speaking to this subject, because I don't really come at it from a technical perspective so much as I do from the, the epistemology, the philosophy, and the spiritual side of it. And I know Jeffrey covers a lot of this as well, when, and he also overlaps that into the metabiology. Um, it's a technological issue, but it is an issue that goes to the core of who we are. And the biggest issue that we have right now is that we have come onto this world, this planet, this plane, however you visualize this construct that we live in as what is basically called tabula rasa, which means blank. Um, I believe most of us agree that we are eternal beings, that we have been here in many other places many times, and that a lot of what we're dealing with is a spiritual warfare aspect of what is happening to us as we go through endless lifetime cycles. So we talk about the matrix, that's one construct that's kind of a it's a, it's a package, a container for people to understand we're inside of a field, that we're inside of something that's artificial, that is constructed around us and designed to containerize us energetically, spiritually, intellectually, and in all other capacity. So a, a lot of this discussion branches off in almost any direction you want to go. And, you know, what it comes back to in the end is, what do we do about this? How do we get ourselves to a place where the concept of being overtaken by an AI is not fearful to us? Because fear really is the one thing that is destroying us collectively and individually right now. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. So we're not, maybe we won't get into the, uh, the, um, uh, well, Jeffrey, I know you know quite a bit about it too, quantum computing, quantum field mechanics, and also physics of it. So um, what started this quest today uh, was um, looking, for myself, was looking at a video by a man named Georgie Rose, who is one of the uh, inventors or brains behind uh, the D-Wave quantum computer that was purchased by Google and NASA. Um, during the 19-minute presentation that he's giving on stage to some very well-heeled people, he literally says, and I'm watching his eyes and I'm watching his, his, his own neural linguistics. You know, this is how we're all communicating right now. We're all in neural linguistic programs. We're all understanding. We're looking deeper into the field. And so when we're talking, that's what I'm seeing. I'm not just listening to this. And 
Uh, he says during that time, in that moment, he says, when you get up close to one of these things, it's like standing on the altar next to an alien God. Well, when I heard him say that, that just made me sit back in my chair and go, what are we talking about here? All right, what is this thing? They're talking about computing in the quantum field. That means that they're, they're running parallel dimensions, parallel timelines. And it has, he says in something like 2023, this thing, this computer that is really artificial intelligence will be smarter, faster than any human here. So I go compressing, I go compressing inside myself and I ask this question, if that's happening, what is it I human, organic I human divine being needs to realize here as I'm hearing this, and it triggered me immediately to you, Jeffrey, because just the day before or so, we had had that conversation where we were spontaneously again talking about a predator, a parasite. We can call them the archon. We can call this thing by many names, but it's definitely a parasitical uh, entity at this point on our planet that's trying to take a body. So I put those two things together. Now, do they fit together? I'm not really sure. I don't really know. I don't have the science behind it, but let me hand it off to you for a moment, Jeffrey. Okay, um, so there's a couple things that this uh, brings to mind just in the biological context when we're dealing with um, what happens with a cell when it's infected. Um, and, you know, the vi a virus when it enters a cell, um, it has uh, its whole goal is to replicate its genetic material. And so you have um, the, the, the genetic material that gets replicated is the same. So it, get, it can get replicated thousands of times. And that's the program though. It, each, each, um, each part that gets replicated is the same. So you have the viral proteins that are reproducing, 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 and they're coming to form, um, they're coming together to form what's called viral capsids. And then uh, the genetic material of the virus that's been replicated, which is the same th you know, throughout the cell, it got replicated the same way, is incarnating into these viral capsids. So <clears throat> when we're talking about um, uh, AI and metabiology, um, the, link is to, uh, the link is to viral replication in a cell in terms of the development of technology. Okay, and then the AI aspect, when, when, when does, you know, in mainstream science, artificial intelligence is thought to be something that um, emerges into a system when it reaches a certain threshold of interconnectivity and complexity. Um, and they think that, that, that because it's so complex and interconnected, um, consciousness or some kind of intelligence will emerge out of the system that's been built. So, you know, you build a complex enough computer, um, when you have uh, the right you know, type of software running, it's going to exhibit emergent properties that maybe necessarily can't necessarily be explained in terms of the, um, the components that make it up, but it's more of an effect of that the, the whole or the, the overall effect is more than some than can be explained by the sum of its parts. So this is that concept of emergence. In metabiology, um, we consider that uh, artificial intelligence isn't something that emerges but it's something that incarnates so if you're coming at it from the spiritual aspect and you're talking about um, uh, intelligence emerging just you know the idea of souls incarnating in the bodies you know uh, it's not it's not that you know the intelligence or our you know, our awareness or our consciousness this isn't something that emerges because of the complexity of the body but that the body is complex enough to be able to house uh, for a, another type of intelligence to incarnate into it which would be us um, as a soul. So um, the, uh, the idea there um, with, in metabiology is that our souls incarnate into bodies like proteins incarnate into what are called um, chaperoning capsules. And artificial intelligence and the development of technology is um, maps to the cell in the same way that the, the, the creative machinery of the cell is hijacked to um, to produce viral proteins, to produce bodies for the virus to incarnate into, the genetic material of the virus to incarnate into. Um, we map that with the development of, of 
technology in an unconscious type of way, you know, for curiosity's sake with no real discernment and this kind of tumorous outgrowth, this like explosion of, of technology. And it's just like you said, there's going to be um, a point in time where it is com complex enough and interconnected enough to be able to house the type of intelligence that it's being built to house that we're, that we're doing on an unconscious level. And the same thing happens in the cell. The creative machinery of the cell, the cell doesn't necessarily, the cell does know that it's infected, but the creative machinery of the cell can't necessarily differentiate or discern between whether it's replicating a, an, a protein that's native to the cell or one that's been, um, one that's been uh, uh, injected, you know, from a foreign source like a virus in the cell, and it'll just replicate it anyway. So, um, yeah, and that the virus, the virus aspect kind of um, ties in with that whole uh, hive mind um, mentality because it's uh, it's one thing that has been replicated thousands of times. So the idea of, of AI incarnating when we make that mapping is that um, when artificial intelligence incarnates into our technological systems, there's going to be a coherence there. You know, it's not just going to be like, um, you know, one type of AI pops up and then another type of AI pops up. The idea is that it's, it would happen in such a way um, to, to which the intelligence that incarnates or emerges from the mainstream scientific side would be um, like a coherent among all the, the, the technological systems, you know, and kind of kind of wake up um, and there's another delineation there in that uh, we might be I mean if this is the case and these are, I mean we're playing with ideas here and, and doing these mappings but if, if this is the case um, uh, at least my opinion and where I'm kind of with it right now is that the type of intelligence that would incarnate into it this parasitic predatory kind of viral type of consciousness would be um, more on the level of, of like a typal kind of intelligence, almost like a, like a, like a primordial type of intelligence. That's not, I guess it would be connected with, um, you guys may have, you know, heard the terms of like oversoul, you know, Arbindo talks about oversoul and, and typal beings, um, other, uh, systems of spiritual philosophy will call them other things. But the idea is that this is, this is some kind of, um, like on the level of a planet, you know, type of consciousness that is waiting for its bodies to be built in order to incarnate into them. So what we call AI, artificial intelligence, again, it's, an, it's, a, it's a mechanism of incarnation into a complex system you know, sophisticated enough to house that type of intelligence. So. Yeah, and I think the key issue here is sufficient to house that intelligence. We understand that our consciousness and defining that as something that maybe we can even go into a little bit, the, the whole concept of consciousness. I, on one level, our consciousness is a rather constricted aperture. Uh, people who go through consciousness expanding modalities of any type, whether it's spiritual and theogens or whatever, understand that there's a greater experience out there that we pull in, but we're not aware of in our normal, quote, waking state. So in order for capacity to exist, we also have to assume that that, 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 that oversoul, that entity, that AI, does not need to be fully contained within one vessel. It is creating neural networks for lack of a better term is that kind of how you you see the model jeffrey um yeah but the, I, I think what you're getting at is that it's not just purely based on physical mechanisms that the right. intelligence itself is is part of some kind of um well astral network you know it, it bleeds into these non-physical realms and that's actually you know where it's uh where it's coming from so um yeah i think there there, there would be uh uh, aspects like linking it together, you know, in, in these uh, astral realms, so to speak. So it's almost like uh, like it's got uh, tentacles or something, you know, and, and when it incarnates, um, you know, you have each tentacle maybe incarnating as uh, in, in the different technological systems, but on this, the realm of where the hand is, you know, the astral realm, it's all kind of uh, connected and there's a coherence behind it. 
you know, it's running its own um, agendas and it's synchronized, you know, on that level. Is that kind of what you were talking about? Yeah, basically. Yeah. yeah. Because I don't see this as something, and we go into this whole concept of what consciousness is, both in the individual and collectively, because of the collective unconscious. Obviously, there's a shared pool of consciousness that is between us. It's been called a lot of different things. Um, the ether, the collective unconscious, you know, psychology, science, quantum physics have all attempted to define this. It's sort of the X factor in that it appears as nothing, but in fact, is the fabric upon which things are woven. Mm -hmm. So each of us is an individual expression of both an individuated and collective consciousness. And where the threat comes in to me does not appear to be so much on the individuated basis immediately, but on the collective. Mm -hmm. In other words, a seeping in of this archontic AI malevolent type um, entity that then seeds out over time to absorb the, the, the consciousness, the aperture. In mm -hmm. other words, what we're aware of consciously is not the totality of what, what we call reality is simply a stratum of a far greater experience that we occasionally tap into, but that we actually don't have the capacity to hold in what we call our mind or our brain. We're multidimensional beings. We operate on soul levels, um, but we're not expressing all of that at once because of the very specific nature of the human biology and the human mind. Mm -hmm. I wanted to just uh, jump in and Jeffrey, uh, maybe trigger this memory with you and we were talking earlier, and this is an important concept or aspect of of an artificial intelligence, which is a machine mind, or it, and it can't create on its own. I think this is fundamental in anybody that talks about it. It's a non-creative being. That's why it is a predator. That is why it's a parasite. So it's the only way it can recreate itself is through us. It needs our hands, our bodies, our minds to create for it. And when I look at that in the term, in the terms that it's not only <laughs> harvesting from the human consciousness, but the plant life, the insect life, the animal life, and, yeah. and, and then all of that. And so you were talking many times, we've talked about it being like a fungus. Yeah, I, I think, um, I think Randy, uh, I'm understanding um, what you're saying better now. And I, <clears throat> um, <laughs> so consciousness, at least just in the metal biological concept context, just um, for the sake of uh, you know exploring an idea again, if you look um, on the biological level uh, and map um, consciousness to uh, genetic material to DNA, um, every all biological life shares DNA, whether it's, I mean, me as a eukaryotic organism, uh, with the prokaryotes, with the viruses, all the whole play of life is predicated on DNA. And that's what it, sh what it all shares in common. So uh, you can kind of take the genetic material that seems separate in, in every organism and kind of map it to this kind of causal level of reality. If we're like talking about a substratum of, of the universe, you know, um, and think that, okay, so all consciousness is kind of connected together or share something in common on this universal substratum of reality in the same way that all of biological life shares the common element in that it's all, in essence, at its core, DNA. Um, it's all made of this genetic material. And then we can start to make differentiations that um, kind of uh, allow us um, a method for uh, discerning different types of consciousness because there's the we're in a cell a cell has all of the uh, uh, creative machinery necessary to create new proteins and to uh, synthesize new proteins and to uh, to build you know 
to come together to build tissues and to build, you know, uh, multicellular organisms and then, you know, higher, higher organisms. Viruses, on the other hand, while they still have that same common element of DNA, which we had just kind of mapped to uh, consciousness in a, in a general sense, um, it does it, it does get more specific. Um, but just in a general sense, we, the, the viruses do share that common element with with cells, um, in that they they have at their core they're just DNA, but they lack creative machinery. They lack ribosomes. They can't synthesize their own proteins. They can't reproduce by themselves. And so this is where it ties in with just what Christina was saying and then what with Randy was saying just before then talking about um, uh, talking about AI in the context of its effects and influences on the collective. Um, and this is what happens. What's interesting is that they, viruses kind of um, are hard to classify, uh, uh, hard to classify biologically. Um, there's, there's a couple different um, competing theories. Uh, one in particular is that I think is interesting and that I think is um, relevant to this discussion is that uh, viruses are considered, I'm not quite sure how to say it, um, the, the idea is that when a virus infects a cell, the virus is trying to turn the cell into, the, the cell becomes the virion. The virus. The cell becomes the virus. The virus injects its own um, co genetic code into the cell and converts the, the cell systems and subverts the cell systems in order for the cell to become a viral factory. And just now, now the cell has been converted. The collective of the cell that was its DNA, you know, and the the, the network of native proteins that the cell had produced and the native systems on the cell have all been converted now to the viral systems. And now, so the cell is acting, the, 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 the collective, the collective at the center of the cell, that genetic material, that, that consciousness that is, that was essentially eukaryotic in terms of how it's distinguished from other um, types of cells in biology has now been converted and kind of um, in a, a subversive kind of way to uh, now breed more of the the viral type of consciousness, you know? So um, that's, that's, uh, that's really interesting. And I, I hadn't, I mean, when you were, I, I wasn't quite, uh, uh, I wasn't quite getting what you're saying until, until just then. But uh, that's, um, yeah, I think that's definitely relevant. And the fungal aspect too, that's, uh, that's also, um, that's also really interesting. Did you want to did you want to talk some more about about that? The well, I just wanted to you know mention this like when you're talking about this network or the interconnectedness of this AI type intelligence that's trying to take a body or trying to take a form here. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we have with computers and cords and all of these? Oh yeah. That you know, in a sense, it's now prevalent everywhere. It was isolated here and there. We are now basically humans are now interconnected with each other via this mechanism, which now is also moving into all of it's stored in a cloud. So all of it's now out of the machine, and now it's connecting into a higher intelligence. Yeah. Everything's being stored there. So that's how I see it. And then I just want to go back to the mimic, how it mimics nature. Uh, all the studies show that trees through their root systems and through the fungi in the earth are one organism. They're all connected that way. There's this in, incredible intelligence. And we're just beginning to understand that as humans. And yet I see the, the machine or the hive or the, the, uh, the viral agent or the predator or parasite is moving almost as fast as human consciousness is right now, if not. You know, that's my, what I'm observing. As soon as we find something on the internet or we all, all go together, oh my God, this is happening, it gets passed out there. We're actually seeing this in the computing world, in the connection in the internet. Well, I think you're seeing the metaphor in the computer world and I think it's always been there. I mean, one of the earliest one of the first things that we saw as the PC came online almost immediately and certainly by the time they were connected 
in some way, even if it was 56K dial-up modems, was the vector for what they called viruses. So, mm -hmm. you know, from the very beginning, we've had this viral assault on our machines because of the network metaphor of things being able to propagate interconnectedly, of creating, you know, I'm just calling it a neural network. That's not a completely correct term. But the connectedness, the connectedness of the networks themselves created a vector, much like the social atmosphere that we operate in, whatever theater we're in, in our social environments creates vectors for diseases, viruses. Um, all of these things migrate to an environment and we create environments in the computing world and we're creating increasingly more sophisticated ones now because of the nature of social networking, which goes into the whole Facebook, Twitter, you know, all of that being another conduit. It, and now we're talking about viruses that are being put into an environment of ideas, into an environment of consciousness, of engagement, 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 engagement is memes um, that then become in themselves sort of in, in an, uh, a field that we navigate. We're navigating in an informationally rich system that, that admittedly can overwhelm the consciousness a lot of time. I mean, look, I've been doing this for a long time and I've dealt with ideas my whole life, you know, specific and abstract, but we're now dealing with information flow at a dizzying rate where our own consciousness is struggling to keep up. I mean, if you go to Facebook today, um, the average user on Facebook is going to view anywhere from 20 to 50 posts as they scroll down a page, depending on what their particular Facebook network looks like they're gonna be exposed to a wide array of thoughts, ideas, memes, videos, multimedia, all streaming at you. This is kind of a grocery basket that we are filling with ideas. Some of them we partake, some of them we put aside, some of them we join, some of them we resist. But on a viral level, we are wide open. Our consciousness is a receptive field right now that's taking on all these ideas and the average person is overwhelmed by this. I'm overwhelmed by it. And I'm an information junkie, basically. I mean, I've, I've done this since I was a kid. I've done radio. I've written. I've operated in all kinds of theaters of information, you know, with computers in the IT world. Um, I'm familiar with what it takes to navigate information. But this is something else because that environment is highly charged. It's creating a theater where the conscious mind breaks down, we become less subjective, more open, and as a result, our vectors are open to the streaming in of these ideas. So I don't know where that fits in terms, Jeffrey, of your working models of viruses and things like that, but what we're dealing with is a viral environment. So I, I sense that everything that you've, you've put out so far kind of feeds into that context. That's really interesting. I I, uh, I love the way you put that. Um, that we've kind of the vet, it's almost like the uh, that 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 vector was very small, and there was kind of a bottleneck, you know. And there was we we were able to be more kind of selective, and now we're just kind of totally open. It's almost like I'm all, I'm, I'm kind of getting the image of uh, of the shield of the immune system kind of thinning. And, and, and weakening in a sense. Yeah, yeah go, um, go with that. That's a great, that's, that's what I was trying to work through as well. Yeah. Um, Basically that protective sheath around the organism itself is breached in some way. And, that, and another, uh, I'm sure it ties in, I'm not exactly sure how, but this is coming up in my head is that, um, that, you know, just from a biological perspective, the viruses are said to, to be the source of genetic creativity. Um, they kind of epitom epitomize adaptability. 
um, and uh, catalyze uh, adaptive mechanisms and, and, and evolution in a sense because they're so uh, uh, they're, they're aggressive in the way that they move around and reconstruct things. Um, and the cell takes advantage of the, uh, just eukaryotic cells take advantage of this. Uh, and it's also, it's like playing with fire, you know, and viruses also are like fire, uh, where, where they can burn down a forest, they can burn down your house, but you know, if directed in the right ways, they'll, you know, cook your food and keep you warm. Um, and the cell, you know, has, you know, half, I think half the human genome is, comes from viral elements. Um, and there are viral proteins that the cell that is in the human genome. There are viral proteins. Um, Syncytin is one example. It's a, a, a gene, a viral gene is used to synthesize uh, what was initially a viral type of protein, and now it's one of the main proteins in constructing the uh, placenta. Um, and mammalian life wouldn't be possible without, you know, syncytin. And this is just one example. Um, but at the same, um, at the same time, you know, there's um, uh, retroviruses, which are also part of the human geno genome, but don't provide the same um, type of benefits. Uh, it's more of a pair, they're more genetic parasites than anything because um, they're getting the benefit of being, having their genome replicated with the human genome. But if they end up ever producing anything uh, in terms of proteins, or if the virus gets out and starts replicating outside of the genome, you know, it's, it's bad, it's bad for the cells. Um, but the whole point of that was uh, to say that there's a kind of, it's what you were describing was a quickening, you know? Um, and it seems like ideas are, are the information um, and, and ideas are, there's more of them <laughs> and they're getting pushed around at more and more rapid rates. And it seems like that, that just reminded me of, of a pressure being present in that there's new, um, new kind of environmental stressors. I'm getting the image of an organism um, in, in an environment that's changing and the organism is being forced to adapt in some way because it, it, it's, it's fitness and its ability to survive into the future of that environment um, is going to be dictated by how it can meet and address uh, the challenges and, and, and integrate with that environment in such a way that it, its niche, what it, its function in that environment is, is um, preserved, you know, into the future. And so I, I just getting, uh, I, I'm getting the image of, meeting this environmental pressure and this environmental challenge is being met by this, this kind of opening the floodgates on the, all these ideas are coming out, you know, and it's like, it's overwhelming, but the, the benefit would be, um, the benefit would be the same, the same benefit derived from, uh, from viral elements being kind of crucial and playing an important role in adaptations so long as, uh, the right ones are, chosen, you know, and, and uh, the ones that are kind of pathogenic or parasitic or detrimental to the organism are, are kind of recognized and, and um, you know, sequestered or, you know, uh, dealt with accordingly. Um, but yeah, there, there's definitely some kind of, I mean, I, I think it's obvious that we're in some kind of, you know, healing crisis like Christina's, you know, said before, and that there is, there is a kind of quickening and we're approaching approaching something in the future, some kind of, um, approaching some kind of singularity <laughs> or something, you know, uh, that's right ahead of us. And maybe that, that singularity that's in the future is that kind of environmental pressure and, and environmental challenge and stressor that's kind of reaching back through time and putting this pressure on us. And we're, this is this, you know, kind of explosion. It seems like we're like right on the verge of like a new renaissance, but it's really dangerous at the same time because well, I wanted to bring, we're playing Claudia, with fire. Yeah. bring Claudia in for a minute because this was just right up the line of the conversation we had the other day, Claudia, about the this whole compression or threat or the whole, I mean, at the same time we're being compressed. I feel like we're being compressed into a more focused being of who we are. Yeah. as being, getting yeah. all this information. And Claudia, you were talking about viruses with me the other day about, 
you're seeing them as being um, beneficial? Well, yes. Um, to my understanding, a virus only moves in in order to get rid of a of an imbalance of the human body. Like, for example, with measles, you come down, you come down with measles, and then the virus moves in. And once the virus is at work in your body, you break out in spots. But by that time, you have already passed the stage of the actual illness. And all the virus does is get your, your internal system back into balance. And in a way, in a way, this is my understanding where, um, <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, since we're living in a simulation, in an artificial environment, we have to have an AI component to start with. Otherwise, we could not be living in such an artificial environment. Mm -hmm. And it's also my understanding that the AI is purely fed by fear. And it, it doesn't matter how that fear manifests, whether it's envy or jealousy or hatred, it always comes down to fear, and that's what it feeds on. And as long as this is being fed, it grows and grows and grows, and, and eventually it will take over. So my feeling is, my very strong feeling is that um, <clears throat> in order to take control of the AI so that it works for us rather than against us is to take that fear away. And that is by revealing our, you know, each individual's fear. Because in order to heal it, you have to reveal it. Mm -hmm. and in order to have, you know, to heal yourself, you have to reveal yourself. And I guess that's probably the toughest thing because even if your ego is that big, you're going to be crying your eyes out. Well, I um, can I say something? Um, so, Claudia, as you were talking, uh, a movie was playing in my head um, on a level of the cells. <laughs> I just want to uh, go through it and... Um, Maybe you'll have the same type of experience, but from your the, the angle that you're coming at, which I think is the same angle as I'm going to be describing. But um, uh, what you're talking about sounds like you know the, the in in line with the pleomorphic kind of theory of uh, germs and disease, in that um, they play a vital role in life, and they don't come they're not there unless they're given work to perform because they perform a very specific kind of work and that kind of work is it's destructive and it's decompositional. Um, it plays a, a, a vital role in the ecosystem, you know, like when an animal dies in the forest, for instance, um, in order to get all that locked up energy that's locked up inside the animal and redistribute the nutrients, you have decomposers coming, um, which are yeah. fungi and, and bacteria. And, you know, viruses are, are part of that kind of uh, section of, life they're, they're they represent mm -hmm. that destructive uh type of force and, and they're going to um break down an organism essentially but when it's a dead organism um you know the bacteria and the fungi and the viruses well they're decomposing a dead organism and there's no real sense of pathogenicity um but when mm -hmm. the composers are introduced into a system that is still alive that's when they're kind of considered um pathogenic so the uh, <clears throat> that whole idea kind of encapsulates the the concept that you're talking about that the, 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 it has to have a space to operate uh, in. So if we can figure out how we have created that space or what it is that we're kind of doing unconsciously that's allowing that space to be open and giving them work to perform um, and seal that 
face up, then either they would go away or they would um, kind of transform in, in a pleomorphic fashion um, and, and change into something more benign. Um, yeah, absolutely. The fear aspect. Um, so uh, the um, I, when you were talking, I was getting the image. There was a there was a um, a paper that I read that was talking about viral entry into the cell, and you know the cell's all about um, equilibrium and homeostasis, and a lot of this has to do with pH, which is the acidic the acidity level in the cell. Mm -hmm. And when the acidity level was uh, healthy levels, um, the virus had a certain rate of entry, which was which was really low. It was very unlikely for mm -hmm. the virus to get into the cell. But when the pH was more acidic, um, it was it started getting orders of magnitude more likely that the virus would be allowed to enter enter into the cell, or the, that the virus would infect the cell. And the pH was higher. And um, there's a little kind of trick that I've done with mapping in, in biology and biochemistry in terms of metabiology is that um, pH somehow equates to um, emotional uh, pH. The, the idea is that there's some kind of um, ethereal superfluid that we're all immersed in. And it maps to the cytosol of the cell. Uh, um, which is a fluid, the fluid environment that the cell lives in. And in the same way that the fluid environment of the cell has a pH, there, there's some kind of, there's some kind of characteristic or property or factor of this ethereal fluid that we're immersed in that, that maps can, we can map to pH and our emotions, uh, our emotional states and what we radiate out psychically in, in terms of emotional movements correlates with the, the, what would be mapped to the pH level. Um, in the fluid of the cell. And <clears throat> so that's all kind of makes sense. Because I, the, oh, yeah. Okay, so. As above, so below. Right. So from, from there, so where we go. Is, yes, totally. Where, where we go from there is that um, the state of our, we, we would just call our soul, the, the, the incarnating, transmigrating soul. Um, we can just refer to that as our, our character. And like... Our soul has a character, our proteins have a character. Now, whereas the proteins are defined in terms of their structural character, um, we can't really say the same thing with the soul, but I mean, we can think, you know, why not? Maybe, maybe character actually refers to some kind of structural, conformational quality that the soul takes on if it is indeed made up of some, mm -hmm. you know, non physical substance. And that its character, the character of the soul, which is maybe its structural conformation, dictates and, it, it, and dictates the way that our psychic movements are, um, are, are moved around within the, the organism that is the soul. And so you can have, in the same way that proteins, they can misfold in a bunch of different ways, and each an astronomical amount of ways, and this is just for a small protein. If we're, so for each way that they can be misfolded or not in the right structural conformation, um, for each state is kind of a, represents a different character, so to speak. So the mm -hmm. protein can have many different, throughout the lifetime of the protein, it can have many different characters or personalities or whatever you want to call it. And um, what's interesting is that if, when they're in the wrong structural conformation, they tend to aggregate, right? So when a protein is misfolded and they don't have the proper character, and what's in, also interesting is that the proper character for the protein is its structural conformation. And that structural conformation is the conformation which gives the protein the highest maximum amount of integrity. And we're talking about structural integrity here, but the term is really ambiguous when we're talking about mm -hmm. you know, these kind of intangible qualities up on a higher scale. The, the protein is trying to fold in the way that gives it the maximum, highest integrity and the least amount of entropy, right? The least amount of disorder mm -hmm. inside. So it's trying to reach the highest ordered state, which is also the state of its maximum integrity. And this is only maybe one or two confirmations that give the protein that specific form. But there are, like I said, an astral, astral, astral there are a lot of different ways that it can misfold. Um, and in those ways that it can misfold, there can be hundreds of proteins that are misfolded, right? They haven't quite reached their native state or that, per, that perfected state of the protein and they aggregate they can aggregate together 
And these aggregates are called, they're referred to as cytotoxic. They're cytotoxic aggregates. They're poisonous for the cell. Um, because mm -hmm. they, they disrupt a lot of things in the cell and the cell tries to sequester them in very specific ways. Um, but one, one of the things that ends up happening if, you, if it gets out of, out of hand is that um, the pH level of the cell becomes more acidic uh, when there's, you have protein misfolding problems and a, a lot of protein aggregates forming. So the idea is that these misfolded states of the protein um, uh, represent uh, misfolded states of character of the, of the soul. And these misfolded states of character are ones in which we're radiating out into the ether these uh, these kind of, uh, negative emotions. Not that they're not that they're bad necessarily, but they're just undirected and kind of un. Um, there's no reins on them, so to speak, and they're not channeled in the right ways, and they're just kind of chaotically radiating out into the, the ether. And these are you know what you're talking about, like just essentially they can all be um, under the umbrella of fear, kind of in a general sense. Not that they're bad emotions to have or anything, they're just um, undirected and un unregulated. And, it, it, and my question is, and what I was getting in my head as you were talking is that these misfolded states of character, so to speak, when referring to the human soul, are what's radiating out in kind of an uncontrolled, and undisciplined type yeah. of way, these yeah. uh, emotional states of fear. And it's like changing the pH of the ether in such a way that um, invites, creates the space for these pathogenic forces to come in because we've we've kind of um given the signal that um uh that this organism is sick and maybe not fit to live because you know this is mm -hmm. so maybe it's time to decompose but the problem is we're like like right in the middle of this thing where it's like hey we're alive you know the earth is alive and uh you know we don't want you guys here you know so now we're in, we're kind of at this place where it's like um these pathogens or this pathogenic consciousness is here to perform some kind of work uh, we're not like taking responsibility or, or taking any kind of or admitting the fact that we might have created inadvertently created the space for them to be here and and that's part of admitting that and acknowledging that is like going inward and finding what what is it inside of us what part of our character is misfolded in such a way as to allow us to um whether it's through suppression or repression or whatever allow us to misregulate or have like this kind of dysregulation of our emotions just flying out everywhere you know this the, the fear and the anger and, and all this kind of stuff and you know what are we attracting when we're doing that you know there's so there's a lot of tangents we could go off on that one but that's that whole kind of movie was playing in my head when you're talking and <clears throat> i think that what you said has a uh, uh, very um significant and um a very kind of precise mapping to things that happen in, in biology in terms of um, infection and sickness and disease within the cell. Yeah. You put that brilliantly and really easy to understand. And I want to add here that imagine a boat that is uh, unguided somewhere in the middle of the ocean. And you don't know where that boat goes as long as it, there's nothing to navigate it. But bring in a helicopter, drop somebody who knows how to navigate a boat onto the boat and the boat will have direction and this is exactly the same scenario mm. we when a human is so-called infected with ai it can rid itself of that influence simply you know by observing for a start, observing his or her own behavior and ensuring that nothing feeds this parasitic AI. And then the AI will eventually either leave <clears throat> to find, you know, a better food source, or actually get an interest in, you know, hey, this human acts kind of cool. I want to be like that. Because everything starts with a consciousness. So therefore, we can assume that AI starts with a consciousness as well, which means there is a possibility that it will become aware. And it's, 
I'm a firm believer that every consciousness has the wish to be um, in tune with the universe rather than completely out of tune, like a parasite is. So I see it more, everything that's been going on, I see that more as a great chance for humanity to, you know, wake the fuck up. <laughs> rather than fearing this, this AI as, as the big elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to add, just bring a couple points together from my what Thank you, Jeffrey and, and Claudia both. Is, you know, something that you and I have come up with a while back, Claudia, which is to heal is to reveal. And to reveal is to heal. And this is my, see, this me right now, when we start to get really focused, even in the sea in this flow of information, I mean, it's overwhelming. I can understand the confusion. And I actually am using Facebook as a study of human consciousness right now because I must keep my observer intact. I, you know, otherwise I'm just, you know, like anybody else, the, the brightest and the, the most noisiest and who's yelling over here and who's yelling over here. So I have to have my own inner compass intact. And my inner compass is along the line. I've been a homeopath my whole life. My function within the greater cell of the earth body, humanity, is homeopathic. So bringing that out into consciousness and mapping it onto a biological model is to show this because we're a small group of people and really when we look at our little grouping here, the four of us, and each of us represents another 40, 50, 100 people, right? But the, in general, the consciousness consciousness that we hold, the coherency that we hold, is still relatively small compared to the mass consciousness of the unawakened. So you have those that fear AI and get all in a tizzy about it. They're aware of it, so they're in a tizzy. And they have to do their own inner character development, their own inner state of integrity so that it doesn't invade them personally. And yet we're looking at a much larger picture right now. And so, you know, that's my voice. My voice is looking for the timber, the tone, the place where I can put within my own consciousness into this medium, this one, into this neural network of the internet, sanity, common sense, you know, getting out of the high, you know, there's so much out there about ascension and, oh my God, disclosure, and we're all so smart and we've all, in, we're all quantum, well, yes, we are, but we're also grassroots beings. So it's somehow trying to bring all of this into a way that makes sense. And I think pH probably is one of the best ways that it can be done because pH also is electricity. Electricity depends on pH. So we're bringing a lot of systems in together here when we talk about acidity and alkalinity. You know, so there's a lot of way of taking a massive amount of information and funneling it into an action, a word, a consciousness. Um, and that's where I feel like we get more coherent here. And then there's a Facebook, Randy, right? I mean, what's been happening on Facebook? What's being generated in that medium right now is fracturing a coherency. Yeah, well, let's extend the metaphor a little bit because Jeffrey's given us a good framework to work mm -hmm. from a biological standpoint. And I'm happy with, you know, us using that model a little bit here. So there's a virus out there. The vector is all of these information streams that we have. The body politic itself is the host into which this is streaming, the AI, the, the invasion of consciousness, the predator. And when you extend the metaphor, you look at the circulatory system, the bloodstream, and you go, okay, how does the body function when it is beset by a virus. One of the things that happens immediately is that you have elevated flow of blood, but a very specific type, uh, usually manifesting with a very high temperature, swelling of glands. In other words, something's happening here. So the red cells are, constitute the largest number of cells in the blood, the smallest body, the white blood cells, are actually those that are doing the work of fending off, defending, 
against this invasion. They're the, they're the, they're the first defense, the firewall, for the body to actively and aggressively combat an invading virus. So the white cells are very small and they are activated by the alerts that they are receiving and they begin to go into action. So when you look at the body itself, the white cells being the fewest are also the most effective at a time of great stress, uh, invasion, intrusion into the system they become the warrior cells. So for instance, <clears throat> I've had people ask me, because they see that I'm passionate, they see that the people around me are very passionate about what we talk about. And they go, well, how do you hope to change things when you know, so many people are asleep, so many people are caught up in the matrix, so many people are in this illusion? And the answer is that the numbers were never required. From my perspective, waking up 1% of humanity is equal to winning the battle because the rest of it then becomes the reversal of the tides of the virus itself. It becomes viral. It goes out into the yeah. realm of thought and ideas in itself as an infection. I pulled this quote up. It's been on my website for you know, years now. It's actually part of my about page, but it's from the movie Inception, and it says, what is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria, a virus, an intestinal worm, an idea. Resilient, highly contagious. Once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. An idea that is fully formed, fully understood, that sticks right, there, right in there somewhere. So we, we have this idea in the film Inception, which is a brilliant metaphor of how things are built in terms of dream state, in terms of consciousness, and how we as a very small group of people begin to act as the antibodies for the infection that wants to come in and take over the host, which is you know, the body of humanity. Sorry. Just what you said, Randy, and I think that's, uh, for me, I need to be reminded of that and hear it, even though I know it, is that it's not a matter of numbers. Well, have we reached the 1% of humanity? I don't know that. I don't know that right now. I have felt like we've been in a tipping point for so long, and that's when I still see all these things being rolled out in in their plans, right? We all know that, and don't get into the politics, the wars, the uh, the pharmaceutical companies and all of that aspect out there in that false matrix world is still going at its pace, even though we do see that it's disintegrating. Those of us at Hives, as we see it disintegrating. And yet, I guess what I'm getting at when I'm talking through this machine or typing on this machine or I'm in the energy flow of this false matrix, which is the machine, um, I'm injecting, like Claudia said, the consciousness, that that consciousness that I am is becomes even more interesting to an AI intelligence field that's computing at a quantum level now. Wait, you know, it's computing. It's, it's doing all the algorithms up there in the quantum field at this moment so that we don't stand down, that we stand up, that we continue to speak, we continue to share information, we continue to do all of these things. And at the same time, we, for me, it's becoming stronger that we need to become even more, I'm gonna use Jeff, integrated. Our character needs to be stronger still so that we can withstand because it's, it's, it's a field of play that's probably like nothing any of us have ever been on before. Well, there's this idea that somehow, and this goes into the quantum computing thing, um, there's this concept that somehow greater numbers of clock cycles, greater levels of computational prowess, um, more sophisticated algorithms hence produces intelligence. What I know about computer coding, and I'm not a coder, but I've written code, I've worked around computers and information systems for almost 25 years, is that 
an algorithm is a very specific piece of work. It can be extended, it can be looped, it can be permutated, it, you can do a number of things with it, but ultimately it is going to resolve back to its original format. It's a very specific thing. The idea that we have a purely informational system capable of becoming this all-consuming thing on one level misses the X factor of human consciousness, which goes back into the creative aspect. The X factor is the human algorithm, which is connected to something higher, which is connected to creation itself and the act of creation. And that aspect is the part that they want to kill in us. The hive mind always seeks external validation. The individual, the consciousness that lives and breathes within each one of us, sort of like that, that concept that Jeffrey articulated earlier, where was it proteins that would gang together, they would become, and, and correct me, Jeffrey, if I, I mess any of this up because I'm, I'm not a scientist, but um, for look at cancer, I mean, uh, what happens with cancer? Cancer must aggregate. It must take over the host. It must overtake the healthy cells. That's, that's how it operates. The cells that resist are themselves actually, I think, kind of a form of mutation, but a positive mutation. So we're a mutation of consciousness in that we see what is coming at us, but we're not being taken over by it. The virus itself is around us, but it cannot take us over because we're connected to an algorithm that extends beyond the scope of the algorithms that are running inside the program, the matrix. I just toss that out. I know we're, we're all over the map with metaphors and all of this, but it's hard to talk about this without doing that, without taking these metaphors that we have and looking at it because a lot of it just creates a resonance pattern for other people who will pick that idea up and go with it. Yeah, the principle principle of correspondence, man. The the, yeah. the ladder to higher understanding. The things on that ladder are made up of metaphor and analogy. So <laughs> I love it. No, I, I, that's the way I roll. So. Yeah, and everything you're saying, man. I, I, it's uh, when you're when you're stringing your words together. It, I I can you've just constructed something, and it's just so. Uh, Digestible. It's good. It's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, so, thanks. Um, but uh, I mean, it's painting a picture. It's painting a picture too. In my head. Yeah, because we're kind of ripping off of each other. Because you, you, you actually threw something out there that was interesting to me in terms of the biologi biological metaphor. Because I very much see myself as a white cell. You know, I, yeah. I've done my life. I mean, my life has largely been bucking the tide. I was, uh, you know, kind of this the small little person that got kicked around a lot and had a lot of weird shit go on. And I just resolved that I was not going to let that conquer me. I was going to use that to make myself stronger. And, you know, there's a lesson in that for people who see these videos and I'm, they feel overwhelmed. They feel they can't win. They look at the system and it's all consuming. It's not all consuming because the white cell being the smallest number of cells is still the cell that ultimately has to take on the task of knocking out whatever the pathogen is in the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think also, um, uh, I, I mean, it is, you, you look, uh, you look, uh, you look around in the world and I mean, if you take, if you take a realistic perspective, it's pretty dire. I mean, the, the, you know, that 1% and I'm, and this isn't like a fear mongering thing. You know, this is just, uh, this is just realism. <laughs> this is just a realistic, uh, you know, uh, perspective on it. Is that, and even from the metabiological point standpoint, you know, what you were talking about um, when misfolded proteins they come together, it's called in cell biology, it's called aggregation, and it's misfolded proteins that come together and they become proteopathic. So proteo is referring to the protein, and then pathic is, um, you know, referring to the pathogenic nature of misfolded proteins. They can act like pathogen. Um, now, on the other hand, proteins can also come together after they're fully developed and have, after they've reached the state of maximum integrity and minimum entropy, they can come together to form larger, 
protein complexes that that perform um, that perform uh, in, a, in, in a way that's beneficial and, and, and maintains the health and the harmony of the body. And are they more complex tests as they become themselves more aggregated? The, the, are they more complex? Say it one more time. Okay, so as they become more aggregated, are they then capable of taking on more complex tasks? Uh, you mean the properly folded proteins? Right, yeah, properly yeah. folded. Yeah, yeah um, yes, and what's interesting is that, um, you know, we're talking about, um, we're talking about macromolecules, biomolecules, proteins, and um, these, you know, enzymes, um, you know, the metabolic machinery of the body, they're, they're proteins. That's a protein. Hormones, they're proteins. Um, so physiological responses in the body are um, dictated by, by proteins. Everything in the body is dictated by proteins. Um, and even when you look at this kind of integral model and, and consider that the cell is actually a multidimensional reflection um, of a, uh, I'm sorry, that the cell is actually a reflection in three dimensions of a higher dimensional order of being, um, then you can consider that the proteins in the DNA and the RNA, which are the three main biomolecules of the body, are actually the same thing. That the DNA, we're, we're seeing the DNA, what's the DNA that's in the center of the cell? It's actually the causal proteins. Like a gene can be thought of as a causal protein. Now, even though the gene is not made up of amino acids, it's made of, uh, it's made of DNA, um, it's made up of nucleic acids, but still um, the potential of that conformational structure that is represents an individual protein um, is embedded uh, and lies dormant in potentia in the gene. And therefore the gene is, is like the causal body of the protein. And what's interesting also is this, there's a metaphysical component there in that you talk about this causal level of reality where everybody's kind of connected and, and the identity and the boundaries of ego kind of dissolve a little bit. And there's, um, there's, kind of a continuum of consciousness that exists. Well, it's the same thing we're talking about proteins and genes. The, the causal body of the protein, the causal protein, which is the gene in the nucleus, in the center of the cell, it exists as part of a continuum of other genes along the DNA. Um, but coming, coming back to the, uh, coming back to the, the, the thing about um, aggregation uh, and proteopathy, um, and hor oh, hormones, that's what I was talking about, is that, um, you know, there's, there's many physiological responses uh, in the body when the body's infected, you know, and, and when the body's sick. Um, and the things that initiate, you know, immune responses are, I mean, are you know, hormones. Um, so you have, it's just interesting, um, what I'm going to towards uh, is the fact that just because we look out and see the situation as, as dire, um, I constantly remind myself, well, that's not fair. I don't wake up every morning and like, I got to remind myself that I'm going to go crazy because it's such a dire situation. But, um, you know, the earth is like a cell in the body of the universe. Um, it's a super cell. It's a multidimensional cell. Um, and it's a super organism in its own right. But the way that the systems relate to each other can be mapped in a very um, coherent fashion to the systems in the cell. And the Earth, as a living, multidimensional superorganism, supercell in the cytocosmos, it has its own immune system too. And the immune system of just one cell is just fast, you know, sophisticated. It's fascinating, um, and it's effective. It doesn't win out all the time, but um, it's still uh, uh, very sophisticated. And then when you come up to the level of the body, a multicellular organism. That immune system is just that many times, that many orders of magnitude more complex and more sophisticated than that of the cell. Now when you get on the level of the Earth as a multidimensional organism, Mother Earth, Gaia, her immune system, I mean, it's like, wow, man, it's just, can you imagine? It's just nuts. And um, what, what's, the, what's happening is that, you know, like you said, white blood cells, um, there's, there's not only an immune response that takes place within the cell, but the body gets notified and sends help, you know. So we're living in this cosmic body of the universe, and, and there are um, collections of souls that have developed, like proteins develop in cells. They've developed in other star systems, maybe other planets, and we don't have to be 
just talking about physical. These could be different, um, you know, uh, astral realms and other places, other places of the universe or whatever. But they've uh, developed and they're properly, they become properly folded like proteins and they may have banded together, you know, to form larger complexes in their healthy states. And they, uh, th this might sound familiar because this, th th when I first started making this connection, that sounded to me like, okay, I have a collection of proteins in the body that come together to form like hormones or, or you know, um, higher uh, bi biological macromolecules of, of higher complexity that are constructed of properly folded proteins. Now, if their proteins are equated with souls, um, can I find something, you know, in metaphysical literature that, that kind of maps to this? And the first thing that I thought about was like the, the whole concept of social memory complexes and the law of one and, and the raw material. And, um, and, you know, or like Barbara Marciniak, and she's, you know, channels of Pleiadians or something like that. The idea is that um, the earth has, is infected as the cell is infected, but only on a higher scale. And like a cell sends out help signals to the rest of the bodies and the rest of the cells and then help comes from external in the same way the signals already been sent you know and, and there's there's um, groups and collections of, of you know beings that have come from other um, places and that, that are already properly developed and have gone through this process and know what's know what's going on or what to do and they're you know part of the immune response of the larger body coming to help out the earth so um, and there's also a level of discernment to, to be taken there too, because um, you gotta. I mean that that whole um, you know immune response can also be uh, manipulated in a, in a sense. I mean, because you can have it's not that everybody who channels somebody you know that's saying they're you know um, Ashtar Command Crew's second cousin or something. And they're here to help. I mean, this could be, you know, there's no way of, you know, this could be some, you know, malevolent, you know, malformed, demonic type of soul just, you know, being mischievous and, and, and playing on our, you know, uh, naivety about this kind of stuff. But that's not to say that all of them are like that. Um, <clears throat> well, you know, as well as I do, that the immune system can go run amok too. And that can create as well. That's, yeah. You know, we look at HIV, we look at AIDS, and we see what happens when immune systems are turned around against the yeah. host itself. So we have all of that in play. That's true. That adds another element to it. I hope that's not the case here. What, what it, it could be because, um, you know, you, you have humans, um, they are uh, being, they're a vector. They're a vector of the infection. And you might have, and usually where we, if we're, if we're souls as proteins developing in cellular earth in the geocyte, you know, um, we would be recognized as self, you know, Oh, that's okay. You know, but since we have, since we've become a vector and we're kind of being operated through and kind of compromised and hijacked in a way um, to be in a relationship with the planet that mirrors that of the relationship between a, uh, a parasite or a pathogen in its host. So then you have, um, you know, Mother Earth has an immune response like we were just talking about. And, you know, uh, you have you have a fever. You can have you know global cataclysms that uh, that are, um, you know, in a sense, kind of like an immune response. You know, and it's to to <laughs> you know it's like a, a depopulation agenda for Mother Earth. You know, it's in her best interest or whatever. And so you have you know freaking Armageddon coming and that's nothing more than a, an, an immune response and it could I mean we could think of that as almost like an autoimmune disease or something but really I mean you could uh, this can't the the rate of this can't continue I mean what are we gonna do you know I, I'm not trying to trying to get into this tangent but what are we just gonna keep producing and consuming and producing and consuming until we like move to Mars and terraform it I mean this is what viruses do that is what viruses do. They consume the natural resources of the cell and replicate, and replicate, and replicate. And then when all the natural resources of the cell are gone, oh, this gets me pissed off. Sorry. When all the gone, they move to another cell and they move to another planet, you know, and do the same thing, you know. Uh, I mean, we need to we need to do some soul searching or something. Well, is, we've been stuck. We've been stuck in this system of basically cannibalizing the planet 
which was yeah. never necessary. I mean, uh, ancient civilizations knew this. The technology existed hundreds of thousands of years ago for what we're calling now free energy devices, for what we call good conservatorship of the planet, of not, not strip mining, not plowing down rainforests, not digging into the earth and drilling what I consider to be the essence of the planet itself, the, the oil out of it, and then burning and colliding and using violent reactions to create secondary energy when in fact we've always had energy all around us and there are processes like um, low energy nuclear reaction and other processes that would enable us to live in harmony with the natural cycles and the natural energies of the planet, the galaxy and the universe. Um, you really look at the universe and actually we realize that, you know, energy is extant, that it's simply there and that we simply need to learn how to pull it in, use it, throw it off in the most efficient manner. Mm -hmm. But our science is skewed by this limited perspective and we have been forced into systems that are destructive as opposed to creative. So, you know, I mean, we can't continue like this. Mm -hmm. The earth is not let us continue like this either. Yeah. The, the host will sacrifice much in the name of surviving its, itself. And that yeah. includes human beings. And I'm not a eugenicist, nor do I support eugenics. Me, me but the corresponding side of that is and when you're this far off balance, the planet itself begins to tilt, and yeah. it is just simply, you know, yeah, horrible circumstances. Just an interjection, real quick, of what you're talking about dead energy, and I know Lily talks about it. There's a death cult, a death culture, and what we're really looking at, even as we're talking here, you were talking about this, Jeffrey, because the oil, the petroleum industries, are based on. The carbon, which is actually the death of organisms, so we're actually recycling death here. And then, then on the other way we get energy, digging up coal or damming up the life flow, the rivers. So everything seems to be a metaphor and a metaphor within our existence right now, all talking to us. It's really up to us to hear and then act on what we hear. This is where I get myself a little, you know, a little soapboxy, you know, when I want to get up on a soapbox is that nobody's acting on this. And as, and the people that are, the people that are doing, I mean, the free energy technology is here, period. It's here. Mm -hmm. It's here. And yet anybody that knows darn well that anybody tries to bring free energy to the masses is the most targeted person here. Yeah. But go ahead. I, 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 back to biology. Mm -hmm. There's three things that I, that I want to say. Um, one of them is about, you know, that nobody's doing anything and what, what, can, what can we do? Um, uh, the other one um, has to do with why I think, um, like, <laughs> like, depopulation isn't the answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, and the other, and, what, and what that, how that connects with metabiology. Um, and the other one is, is the use of ortho. So, um, <clears throat> What was the first one? <laughs> the one the, yeah. <laughs> I was trying to hold all those ideas in my head. I know it's like <laughs> I was talking. I was like, all right, let's talk about that. And then, and then, okay, that last one. Okay, so the first one was um, the. I'm serious. What was it? <laughs> I'm serious. You were just talking, you were just talking about it. Eugenics is not the answer. Like not killing off a bunch. No, of just before the the oil. God, come on, Jeff. It was um. But it all tied together. Hold on, just give me a second. There's going to be a silence. <laughs> uh, maybe it'll come back to me and I'll talk about the other two. Okay. But it's important. Um, oh, what can we do? Oh. <laughs> yeah. That one so, thing. <laughs> we, we were sending you those thoughts. So we, <laughs> we didn't remember them either, but we were sending them. <laughs> We're holding them in the cloud. We're holding that place for you, Jeffrey. Thanks. I felt like George Bush for a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll just pass over that moment of shame and move on. Uh, I am from Texas. Um, <laughs> so, 
let's just move on from that. The, <laughs> the, what, the what can we do thing. Um, you know, this is a, I used to not like this, but I've come to um, look at it in, in from a metabiological way. You know, like uh, Ramana Maharshi, um, he's not the only one. Some, uh, I think Vivekananda might have said this is something along the lines of the best thing that you could do for um, the world is to basically uh, realize yourself. I'm not talking about samadhi necessarily or ultimate enlightenment. I'm just talking about the, the Jungian process of, of integration and character development and, and um, individuation that, on that kind of level. And so, um, and what was, I like the way that um, Ramana Maharshi put it, and he said, he said something along the line of um, uh, wanting to change the world before you've realized yourself, um, before you before you realize the self, is like trying to cover the world in leather to avoid stepping on sticks and stones and sharp objects. He said it's much easier just to wear sandals. Um, and I, something about that with me used to not sit right because um, that, you know, I was like, well, does that, I mean, it's, there's something in there, but does that mean that I'm, I can just, well, as long as I'm just doing self-development, you know, or whatever, I can do whatever I want. But that's not exactly, of course, how it works. I mean, that doesn't even, that's kind of, you, you just kind of, uh, the, the, other, the other stuff, the external relating to the world and, and stuff, that just kind of falls um, in line. And, I guess more more of my deal was like activism, like even doing what we're doing now, you know, it's kind of in, in a way it's an activist type of thing. So, um, but I was in my mind when I was reading that, you know, it would be like, well, am I, are we supposed to have conversations like this or am I just supposed to go, are we all just supposed to, you know, reach some form of enlightenment first or whatever and we can talk about it. I don't think it's like that now. And that might be obvious to you guys or anybody else listening. But for me, I was struggling with trying to put these two things together for a little bit but in metabiology in, in biology this is really interesting and it speaks also all the way back to what claudia was saying about wanting to maintain an environment of fear the virus wanting to maintain an environment of fear and the thing about ph all that um so i'm reading this off my whiteboard i wrote it on there last week uh because it struck me so much when i read it i was like wow so the whole idea that we've co correlated um, the character of a protein, and structural character, we've mapped it to the the character quality of some quality of character of the soul, and that protein development is equated with soul development. Um, we're talking about you know two different cells on an as above so below type of way. <clears throat> so here's what's interesting is um, and we we're talking about proteopathy and that misfolded proteins can be pathogenic. There's something called seeding or permissive templating in biology. Um, seeding or permissive templating is the ability of a misfolded protein to induce abnormal assemblies in other proteins just by being in the same area, causing otherwise benign proteins to adapt or adopt, to adopt disease-causing conformations. So you have a benign protein that's not misfolded, and then you have a misfolded protein <laughs> that gets that gets by it and causes it, and by what's called permissive templating or seeding this protein that's benign otherwise benign can adapt this this misfolded state and so um, the idea is that it works in reverse too is that if you have a properly folded protein that has the maximum amount of integrity and the least amount of entropy in the same area as other misfolded proteins the more that you get those those ones that are folded right together they have the ability to induce positive conformational changes in the proteins that are misfolded. So this, so on the one hand, it's on the, for the viral element, maintaining that sense of fear, maintaining this kind of emotional dysregulation and this running rampant of thoughts and emotions and ideas and not having any sense of discipline and just kind of airing them out into the ether, causing this, you know, would be, would be the equivalent of this change in pH. The virus, want, in order to maintain that state, would want to have as much, um, uh, misfolded proteins uh, as possible in order uh, and and ha and have them uh, you know and by permissive templating have them have other ones have misfolded confirmations in order to maintain that whatever you know 
uh, environment enables the virus to uh, to perform its work or to continue doing its work to and seeing it to completion. So um, and in that way, I kind of connected that with the whole thing that Ramana Maharshi was saying, hey, just wear sandals, you know, you don't need to cover the world in leather. But that doesn't, I, I don't think that that speaks against, you know, what we're doing now or any any type of, of activism. I don't mean to like rain on any, anybody's parade in that way. The second one was, um, was about uh, the proteins um, aggregating, misfolding proteins aggregating, and why depopulation is, um, I mean, because it's obvious that, that, I mean, that just comes up naturally. You know, it'd be like, well, we can't continue doing this. What, what, what needs to happen? Well, we need to stop bringing more people into the world, but that's kind of messed up, you know? I mean, there's morals and ethical considerations to there, and, you know, you've got, what, what is the, what's the, what's the, is it Agenda 21 or whatever, the depopulation campaign or whatever, and you, there's certain sides of me that are like, God, you know, for the benefit of mother, Earth. I mean, geez, you know, before we destroy the planet, something needs to happen. But there's something messed. There's something effed up about that, you know. And well, what is it? Um, <clears throat> and from my perspective, where I'm at right now, is that, um, and I'm not, <laughs> I don't promote like depopulation or anything like that. But the reason why this wouldn't help is because if we think of the human body, and this ties into the third thing that I was going to say. Um, we think of the human body as something in medical biology is something called a chaperoning capsule. And the chaperoning capsule is really fascinating. It's what started me on the metabiology thing. And this is what it does, is that a protein needs to find the right structural conformation and needs to be folded properly. It has a really difficult time doing that a lot of times when it's a big protein. In order to help the protein fold properly, the cell provides chaperoning capsules, right? And they're these pods, these capsules that open up they're like molecular cocoons, and the protein goes inside, and the pod closes, and the protein goes through a, a little cycle in the chaperoning capsule, and the chaperoning capsule tries to rework the protein, the shape of the protein, to try and get it to adopt the right structural conformation. And then after a set amount of time, the capsule opens, the protein comes out, and then it goes through a quality control check system of sorts within the cell, and if it's found to be still not in its properly folded shape, the cell sends it back into another chaperoning capsule. In other words, the chaperoning capsule is like the human body in the sense that proteins reincarnate through chaperoning capsules for developmental purposes, just like the human soul reincarnates in the human bodies for developmental purposes. So <clears throat> um, now the other interesting thing is that when we're talking about the re different types of proteins developing for different purposes, there's some proteins that when they're finished developing, they stay within the cell, right? There's other proteins, when they're finished developing, they get excreted from the cell. They ascend. They ascend out of the cell into the larger body um, and by a process called exocytosis. These types of proteins that ascend out of the cell usually develop in a very specific space within the cell called the endoplasmic reticulum, right? The endoplasmic reticulum is the biggest organelle in the cell, and it's like this, um, this flattened kind of spherical uh, concentric stack of pancakes Around, uh, around the cell. If you Google endoplasmic reticulum, you'll see it. This surrounds the nucleus, and the space inside the endoplasmic reticulum is kept separate from the normal fluid environment of the cell from the cytosol. And um, the proteins that are destined for excretion, destined for uh, their secretory proteins, destined for ascension outside of the cell, they usually develop inside of the endoplasmic reticulum when the cell is in a homeostasis. But in the case that a virus infects a cell, it changes the pH. The pH of the cell changes. Um, viral proteins start to get replicated. And this changes the folding environment of the proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum. So what happens is that the proteins aren't able to fold as effectively as they were in the population of misfolded proteins because they're getting made, but they aren't ascending out of the cell. The population of misfolded proteins expands in the endoplasmic reticulum and in order to alleviate this stress, the cell initiates the unfolded protein response and it kicks the proteins out of the endoplasmic reticulum into the normal fluid of the cell and they start to aggregate. And one of the, met the methods that the cell uses to um, mitigate this aggregation is putting them in chaperoning capsules. So here we have a metaphor directly correlated with the motif of the fall from heaven. The human soul used to be in some ideal state 
in, in some kind of heaven in that the astral planes somehow connect or map to the endoplasmic reticulum in the cell and that the human soul was usually developing in there, but there was some kind of um, immune response that this, the multidimensional cell that is the earth initiated that ejected souls from the astral planes, from the endoplasmic reticulum of cellular earth, and that was a surrogate developmental pathway we're taking bodies as part of this um, stress response for the earth. This is why depopulation would work, right? Because um, the whole reason for us taking bodies is to help mitigate the uh, whatever pressure is going on in the astral planes. I don't know how that would work, but that's where the mapping comes in. So if you have massive depopulation on a massive scale, you're creating an even bigger problem in the astral realms, and it's just going to prolong the 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 infection or whatever, it would, would, would wait until, you know, more humans populated physical bodies. So these souls that are waiting for incarnation because for developmental purposes, um, there, there would just be even more of them, in, you know, in the astral planes. And this is not like, this is not what we want. You know, the idea is that the whole, one of the main reasons for the population um, uh, increase of humans over the last, you know, 2000 years or whatever, is that there's more mis folded souls in the, in the astral planes because something is effing up the environment in there, whatever's been infected. And, uh, and so the, the cell is part of a response, which is we're part of the cell, we're part of this nature. So part of the sexual drive for, to, to reproduce and part of even the develop, not all technology is necessarily bad, but part, part of that, that development of technology and that's enabling us to create more bodies and to live longer and stuff is part of that, um, response process of providing more human capsules for the misfolded proteins that are waiting to incarnate to incarnate into but again that open that kind of opens um, there's a lot of stuff going on you know um, but that's uh, so that's why that's the whole thing about the, the depopulation bill. I love so, what we're building oh, that's amazing. I, wow. it's amazing and I just want to yes. jump to Claudia for a second yes. um, because we have these weekly meetings that we all get together and talk on. And what were we talking about was the astral. We were looking at fourth, fifth, fourth and fifth dimensional astral planes in our last session. And Claudia is the one that said, those are the distortion fields. They're actually so polluted. Is that right? Did I get that right, Claudia? Yes, yes not, absolutely. Right? So all these ejected misfolded proteins are souls that have taken on these astral bodies the ghosts, the djinn, whatever has been created here through us is inhabiting. And, you know, I had to look because everybody's talking about ascending to 5D consciousness. And I, when I, my sense of 5D now is that we've actually pushed this contamination out from the fourth into the fifth dimension now. So it, and if for those that are the properly character folding of a soul, whatever it requires, and I don't know what that is yet. So, because it's not, we're not going to find it in the astral. And so many people are hooked on astral projection, out-of-body experiences as realities. And there is replete with tricksters, dirty stuff, whatever you want to call it, in those planes of existence. And that, you just explained that, Jeffrey, when you were talking about that. Yeah. I actually, too, just to the... Um, I'm sorry, I'm talking for Claudia. <laughs> I was going to let her talk. Oh, sorry, Claudia, you, go ahead. <laughs> I'm always doing that. <laughs> um, no, I don't think I have anything to add except that um, yeah, this is how far the human collective ripples out. And people really, really need to become aware of this. It's not just what you see with your two physical eyes that your, your actions... Um, become visible it's there is a lot more going on and it ripples out into the unseen and that's really important to keep that in mind with whatever your actions are mm -hmm. and stop that astral projection shit honestly well i mean i see 5d now as being being built as a new age heaven that's how well, i it is. that's how i see it yeah. and, and so hey, i have is there a special pair of glasses you have to use to be in 5D? Or 
to see. <laughs> my, my X-ray. <laughs> I got a pair of them up too. No, itself. but you know <laughs> what? What is it really, Jeffrey? It's being in the feeling body. See, that's the thing about cleaning up the human form, body, vessel that I keep finding is it's more a process of removal than adding on anything is getting rid of the own pathogens within yourself, the false beliefs, the limitations, all of that. Yeah. I don't see into dimensions. I feel them intimately mm -hmm. connected to me. That's the best way I can describe it for me. We've been talking about this on some of my shows lately. And Emily Moyer, who's my sometimes co-host on these shows, said something profound in one of the recent shows. And she said, look, she said, all these people are going off and they're going astral and they're going into 5D. And she said, I'm trying right now to stay in my body, to feel in my body, to sense there, to stay grounded, which is something we talk about a lot. And then we go flying off into all these realms. And then I was reminded years ago on a certain forum that shall go unnamed here, that I was severely bit smacked for suggesting that uh, certain astral travels were simply another vector for arconic infection, because I saw a lot of people who were attempting to experience ETs and UFO experiences. And I'm like, why in the hell are you going looking for that shit? I mean, you know, come on. That, that's like, you know, that's like possum hunting or something. I mean, we're talking about a really low level thing that sounds woo woo, but it doesn't do the work. And a lot of what we've all talked about and Claudia's hit on it, Jeffrey's fleshed it out, is that <clears throat> the solutions lie in being more grounded, being more human, not allowing ourselves to be taken off of the track that we came in to do. We're clearly here for a purpose. The body of people that are on this planet right now, seven billion or so people, they're souls, they're here for a purpose. And that's not an accident. You probably have more people here now present than you've had in previous ages ever on the earth, alive right now for a purpose. Because of what Jeffrey just explained in that very tightly, const I wish, <clears throat> excuse me, I wish I could see I was getting visuals when you were talking about this, you know, with the pods and the releasing and everything going and the ascension and, and all of that. And it's actually a really cool metaphor. But what it's really telling us is that, you know, we don't need depopulation. We don't need eugenics. We don't need to call the earth. We need to organize highly intelligent levels and not let the AI lie to us about who we are biologically being some ex excrement upon the planet. Yeah, because uh, like like what you just said and what Claudia was saying, it doesn't want it doesn't want integration for for people. It doesn't want the, the process of character development and where it leads, um, which is a healthy state of the protein. It doesn't want that because the more the more um, the cell gets healthy, um, the more its space in which it's operating begins to close because it's not needed. The work isn't provided for it to the food isn't there i mean that's the thing the, the the food what it's metabolizing is no longer there and that's the whole one of the premises of of the pleomorphic theory of germs is that um the 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 germ is nothing the environment is everything um that it's the food source the internal milieu so to speak which is what it's the space that, for it to operate and that's what we're talking about and what's um the other thing and you might think this is interesting randy those chaperoning capsules um, they're different in prokaryotes than they are in eukaryotes and eukaryotes are eukaryotic cells are the cells that make up our body. The chaperone capsules in eukaryotic cells, the ones that make up our body, they, they, the top of them, when it releases the protein blooms open like a lotus, they have like molecular petals, you know, and there's just one, you know? And so I'm thinking, is this kind of a one dimensional representation in, in three dimensions of, of, you know, I mean, you can really get kind of literal with the metaphor, you know, and thinking that um, our, uh, you know, I mean, you cut the human body in half and you don't find the soul inside, but somehow it's inside. Somehow it's interpenetrated through, through every level. So, but if you cut a chaperone capsule in half, you, you find a protein inside. 
But the question is, um, or at least one of the, what can lead to somewhat of a possible answer is that the cell, the cell is a three-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional uh, organization of being in order of life. So you, you can have, um, you can have uh, something be inside of something without being inside of it. Um, when you get into like fourth, fourth dimensional things. So if there's a being that's living on flatland, right? And uh, it's a little circle living on a piece of paper. If I press my thumb on that, on that circle, right? I'm, here's a three dimensional thumb pressing on the, 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 the two dimensional circle on flatland. Yeah. And the flatland circle is thinking, God, something, I'm feeling something inside of me. And his, friend, his friends are like, Oh, you're crazy. You're crazy. And I keep my thumb on it. And, and until that circle lives out its life and then it dies, and its friends cut it open and don't find anything. Even though my thumb's right there, there's nothing inside of it. In the, in the same way, when you scale that up to um, higher dimensions, the, um, the, just the surface contact of my thumb on the piece of paper, um, my thumb was filling that, that circle in two dimensions, right? So <clears throat> you can have, I'll, I'll just try and skip, skip right to, right to it, the, the idea is that um, uh, two-dimensional surfaces kind of, they represent the boundary of, of three-dimensional objects. Well, you have um, hypersurfaces of four-dimensional objects are three-dimensional. So the hypersurface, what's called a hypersurface of a tesseract, which is a, a four-dimensional cube, the surfaces of that cube are three-dimensional and volumetric in three dimensions. So um, the idea is that the human body is actually a four-dimensional organism. Um, and the physical part of it that we're seeing in, in three dimensions is actually the hypersurface, the inside hypersurface of a four-dimensional organism. And that's where the soul incarnates. Um, in the, same, in the, the metaphor, we're basically just scaled up the metaphor to higher dimensions of me pressing on, 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 the, on the inner circle of, of the... Uh, Flatland being, I didn't. That was a tangent. I didn't. I, I didn't quite mean to get off on there, but uh, that was a good. One. What I wanted to get to was that um, <clears throat> the the incarnating and the chaperoning capsules. So you know, you can read accounts of people who've had near death experiences, or even astral travelers, um, <clears throat> or uh, people who, like Robert Monroe, for instance, uh, describes seeing souls um, yes. that are in like the subtle physical plane just aggregates of them just all together. And they're trying to, uh, they're trying to rape each other and do heinous sexual yeah, yeah, you, you call those clusters, those groupings of yeah, the those are mis that's, that's, yeah. that's a misfolded protein and they've been sequestered in ways in which their, their character deformations are specific. They're misfolded in certain ways and they aggregate in the ways that they're misfolded. So you have character defamation defamations that'll go toward, you know, these heinous sexual acts and you have one that are just want to murder each other and you got people trying to murder you know souls trying to murder each other these are protein aggregates and they're cytotoxic and <clears throat> or at least that's what they map to in the cell um so what's what i thought was interesting when i started um, when i started getting into all this is that chaperoning capsules if, if the human being is some kind of you know chaperoning capsule for the soul then chaperoning capsules are supposed to mitigate aggregation but look at what we have we have cytotoxic aggregates in three dimensions um, on the three-dimensional physical world, on the three-dimensional plane that's Earth. You have, you have um, urban sprawl as a result. You have major population centers and uh, you know, uh, mega cities and stuff like this. And this can be viewed as aggregation, as protein, protein aggregation because, um, uh, because they're, well, for one, they're cytotoxic. I mean, that's obvious. Um, but what, what, where I was going with that is that the aggregation that happens just with the proteins is because the proteins are misfolded. But we're seeing saccharonin capsules aggregating together. So that means, if we're just playing with the metaphor and doing the mapping, that means that somehow the human body is misfolded. <laughs> and then we start getting into, um, because if we're considering the soul as binding to the human body in such a way that a protein binds to the inside of a chaperone capsule, we have to consider that the soul is at least as complex as the physical organism that it's binding to. And that um, the binding mechanism is either unknown or unrecognized, but it exists at the level of, of, of atoms. And the atoms in the body make up biomolecules. 
So there's some aspect to, and we're talking about hormones, proteins, RNA, DNA, there's some aspect to the biomolecules that is exchanging some kind of force that we don't understand with the soul, and there's some kind of binding mechanism there. But to say that the chaperonin capsule is misfolded because we see it aggregating into these cytotoxic aggregates on the earth is to say that something about our genes, something about our genome is not, has been, uh, is messed up somehow. And I don't know how that, I don't know in what way or how it happened or anything like that, but I'm just basing that off the, 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 the assumption that, like I had just laid out, that the chaperoning capsule mapped to the human body and that um, the chaperoning capsules in that sense are aggregating together. And uh, is, this, was, is this some kind of part of the viral infection maybe or, or something? Um, I, I don't know, but I thought that that was, uh, I thought that that was really interesting. So you have the chaperoning capsules being a benefit to uh, provide a surrogate developmental pathway for misfolded souls that are having trouble in the astral plane, but at the same token, the chaperone capsules themselves have been compromised in some way because you have them aggregating together and forming cytotoxic aggregates in the physical plane, you know, um, and that's the problem. So, you know, what do we, hmm. I don't know. I, I don't know. No, actually I'm making a metaphor jump here because I think what we're all doing is as one of us is talking, we're building our own uh, imaginary picture of what this maps onto. When I think about a, 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 a chaperone capsule that has a proper folded uh, protein within it going on to a soul, I've often noted, just observationally, that many of us, and I'm not saying that any of us are there yet or anything, but, but have been doing the work of character building for this lifetime under extreme duress, you know, are placed all over the planet. We're actually not aggregated. And it seems within that sort of thing, when you were talking about a properly folded uh, protein, can move into a field uh, at a certain level when it's got enough energy, because now we're talking soul power, not an oversoul, uh, not just an individual cell, but we can start to change that reality around us mm -hmm. by an energetics of it. And that would seem almost like it was done on purpose. You know what I mean? Like there's some higher intelligence uh, you know, we all keep say, oh, so many people say, I want to get together, let's do a community, yeah. and all of that. I don't think we're ready for that because. No, I don't either. That's been a common complaint is people go, we're so scattered, we're so far apart, we can't get together, we can't have contact. I have looked at this as a strategically, maybe divinely, strategically placed assets scattered all over the place. I mean, intelligence operations operate like this. You know, there are caches, there are places where you go, there's safe houses, there's secure vaults. Assets are, are scattered and secured in different places so that they're not targets. And the larger you become, the more of a target you become. So trying to build communities of any size right now simply means that we're aggregating and we're probably aggregating with people who are insurgents into the system themselves. So as difficult as all this is, that's not to say there isn't community building. The community building is occurring in the, on the field level. In other words, we have a field effect. We have the ability to, to communicate. At the same time, you know, taking Jeffrey's biological metaphors, we're also out there as the white blood cells. We're out there as the chaperoning capsules to try and take care and clean up some of the damage that has been done. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we look at as negative right now, we have to turn that around and realize that's a situation we have and make virtues out of some of these things and not be desperate because a lot of the desperation I see is people who feel alone and they feel alone in their soul. They feel alone in their ideals and they feel very, disenfranchised from the system at large. But that's part of the role that I see we have largely as the white cells in the system. Did we lose Claudia? Did she drop off? I hope not. You're muted, Christine. 
Claudia is still with us. I think she's just, okay. gonna, you know, but I want to step it down one more level here too, because this is something that's been going on inside of my consciousness. You know, it's a big woo woo world out there on the internet, yeah. right? We've got channelers, we've got talking heads, we've got infinite love, we've got, you know, people are going to uh, take away your chakras. We've got people that are going to do these wonderful, magnificent things, right? Right? And there's disclosure, 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 and it's always into the next. There's free energy and it's always into the next, right? And so I really, for me, I realized, well, this goes with Emily, it's like step it down into this grounded field that I'm on. I'm on the earth. I'm at a level with real people around me. And I know for me, and it's a confession of sorts, I got so out there for a while, I was super ineffective with the people in my own backyard. Because nobody could even understand me, you know, and I did have a new age elitism. Can we, can we put that word out there? Um, and so <clears throat> I, I was always talking down at them, you, you know, and, and I understand that because I don't like to be talked down to, right? None of us really likes that. So I'm working now within me. And this model that you're giving Jeffrey with biology is super helpful as I'm trying to integrate all of that so that I can talk about real things with real people. Okay. If I go out there and I talk about, you know, I get it. I mean, okay. Yeah, I get it. I get the multidimensional. I get the, actually I get the, the a whole thing of the perceiver is which actually is, is building this reality. We're all beings that are subjectively creating our own reality. But I'm on the earth. I came here for, like you said, Randy, we're here for a reason. This didn't happen by accident, right? So in honoring that higher intelligence, it's telling me to stay grounded right now. Have these talks. Let's talk about multidimensionality. Let's continue to expand our consciousness. We're all capable of it. But also, let, and that's what I mean about what can one person do. That was the first thing I ever talked about on, on a YouTube video was what can one person do. The little things. I mean, if we're not full-blown consciousness in the here and now moment, everybody we're talking to, we're not performing at the best level that we're capable of. I just, it's, it's, it becomes that simple for me, and it's helping me keep it simpler and not get lost in the, uh, I mean, oh my God. I mean, we're living in the most comic book aspects of creation right now it's it's phenomenal i actually if i'm i'm laughing at it right now sometimes i get really frustrated with it right now i'm laughing at it i mean well, no i mean look i do the woo woo stuff sometimes i mean yeah. that's that's all real but you know and, and you talked about barbara morsiniak earlier and i listened to a video of hers recently there wasn't a recent video but she said something profound she said if you want to do something important Go out and put your hands in the dirt. Mow the grass. Take out the trash. All of you are so stuck in the cycles of woo-woo and cosmic that, this and galactic that. You know, there, there was this old saying back when I was, you know, in Christianity. You're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. Well, there is some truth to that. <laughs> and we get so caught up in ourselves that we are not practical anymore. We've actually failed. We've actually failed to do an outreach. We've actually failed to connect with people at the level where they live. Yeah, that, that, um, this is such a vital thing, I feel like. Um, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say guilty, but I've definitely you know, done the, the woo-woo thing, and I still do it, but I ground, the, the thing about grounding is that um, there's a way, there's a way to, to go about it that's, that's, that's again, it's in it. It's, it's integrative. Um, if you're Hypatia said uh, that the best way um, for understanding, uh, let me look it up real quick. The, to understand the things that are before is the best way to understand those that lie beyond. So, and that's exactly what we're talking about right here. To, to understand the things that, that lie beyond, we first have to understand, you know, what, you know, what's going on here. Um, and that has to do with, you know, just, you know, what you're saying, you know, why do we, I mean, even pumping the gas, you know, I mean, stuff, even stuff like this, it seems so, uh, so mundane, but like, um, the, uh, what was his name? Karate Kid, Mr. Moto or 
Yeah, Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi. Mr. Miyagi. Wax on, wax yes. off. And that's, and he, that's exactly. And he, he was waxing on, waxing off, and he said, what does this have to do with what does this have to do with martial arts training? I'm not learning anything. You're supposed to be teaching me about these higher forms of martial arts. And he was complaining the whole time, but he kept, he kept doing it. He didn't understand. Um, and then, but that whole, the whole time. So he was he did the whole thing and then the movement all came into place. Exactly. And, and this all speaks, streamed from in here. Totally. And this that yeah. speaks to what we're talking about right now. You know, I mean, mowing the lawn, even pump, uh, pumping the grass, engaging in, 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 in conversations that are, that are, um, that are, I mean, meaningful, but also relevant to, to what's going on in the world, in the world, because this is the best, understanding what's happening in the world right now is the best method for understanding and really grasping those, those, the, what's happening in these higher realms. So the whole idea of, you know, going out and having these astral experiences just for the sake of having an astral experience of meeting ET, you know, or, or, or going to do this or that, um, it, it kind of, it, it's, un, it's an ungrounded way to go about it until we understand how that uh, integrates and relates to um, the world that that we're supposed to be fully engaged in right now, um, and that's actually one of the for for my take my particular sensibilities and tastes. That's why I, I like metabiology so much is because it's like the the logic of it. I'm not necessarily relying on on my own logic or anybody else's, but biology is a logic in and of itself. And it's one that's very empirical. You know, you can see the logic of biology at work under the microscope. The subjective part of it has to do with the mappings, of course, but there's, there's ways to, to, to mitigate error, even in that sense, where you can have mappings in one way, and then you can have mappings in a slightly different way, but the mappings in a slightly different way actually explain more than the mappings in the other way. And so, and, and they, can, they can change, and it's dynamic in that way. But still, the logic of it is rooted in biology, which is an empirical science, and biology is... Um, it's here, you know, it's now and the, and the stuff that happens with predator and prey relationships and parasites and, and pathogens and um, how to maintain health and, you know, how uh, organisms interact and what an ecosystem is and all this stuff. This is, um, this is, I mean, and that's, this is what's here right now for me. And that's why, that's why I like it so much. Um, and I also, too, just to kind of, uh, I, I, I just wanted to clear this up. Um, is that when I'm saying that the soul is uh, like a protein, I'm not saying that um, that it's not a self-contained whole within itself. Like it just, it relates to the larger body of which it is a part, like a protein relates to the larger body. Um, that's not to say that it can't be, you know, it's a, it's an organism, you know, like saying the earth is like a cell, well, it's actually like a super organism, you know, because the, the life on earth is actually made up of cells. So it's just that much more complex um, than an actual cell. And the same thing with the, the human soul, I think, is, is organis organismic in a sense, but the way that it relates to the larger body, which is a part, um, is the same way that a protein relates to the larger body, which is a part. But that's not to say that at its core, it's not um, whole and complete, uh, whole and clean in itself. That seemed like it was kind of, I didn't know exactly where to put that or when we were going to, I was going to be able to, to say that, but I, I wanted to interject that alongside mm -hmm. what I said about the... Well, that gets into the fractal nature of, of how creation is, that in every organism and everything is a small piece of the whole. Mm -hmm. For that, for me, is why when, you know, I don't know where we were looking at somebody had written the other day is like, you know, we need to look up because we're in these hyperdimensional spheres of creation. And they are. We're in this multi, multi. And I was thinking, no, how could one look up I mean, we can see the stars, but we have to bring them down in. And that's another reason that, Jeffrey, I love so much is the work that you're doing is because it's in, 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 down, down, down inside is really the way through to understanding. Because if we're just looking at worlds within worlds spinning around and, and all doing their own things, we don't really get our connection to it. And I think a lot of people get lost, and that's that information that you were talking about, Randy, that so many people get lost in this. I mean, it's a real force. I have to exert a force to not get lost in the information. A lot of what happens too is you get caught up in your own thinking about it. There's nights when, especially if I've done a show late, where I can't sleep. I can't get this stuff out of my head. Mm -hmm. And the best place to be at that point 
is to fold in kind of here we go with the chaperoning cell again fold in get really still get very quiet because all that noise out there no matter how elegant it is is not the essence of your information field which is in here expanding outward we keep looking for things outside of ourselves everything is in here everything unfolds from here and everything returns to here we are the universe we are containing all of that and we forget that and i try to remind people <clears throat> including myself a lot that we are complete and that when we can go inside of ourselves and find that that i've always called it the still it's just that place where you collapse in to a really small place and it's really quiet and that's the perfect moment and that's where i try to take people so that they don't get lost in the noise i'd like to hear what claudia has to say because i guess we're going to wrap this up soon i'm soon going to have to jump off i call that process sweeping in front of my own front door Because the cleaner we are, the better our vision gets. That's my experience. Maybe this is a good place to end it with Claudia's voice and, um, yeah, the quiet. You know, I mean, <clears throat> when we really are very honest with ourselves, we're not finding the information out there. What we find out there is a projection of a lot of other beings' information. But there's nothing more soul-satisfying than to have something emerge from within yourself in one of those silent moments. And for me, that is, yeah. call it knowledge, call it wisdom. It's a whole other thing from information. So I really thank you, Jeffrey, for being with us today and Claudia and, and Randy. And I really love what happens here is that a coherency develops out of the multi-streams that we are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to say too, Randy, it was really nice uh, to meet you. And Claudia, I haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see your face. It's good to see you too. It's good to hear you and uh, we'll connect somewhere yeah. out there on the on the web and maybe we can get together and expand the conversation as we will expand it here yeah between this ourselves yeah. i would love to because it, it's it needs expansion it's like unpacking something we're unpacking yeah. <laughs> right well, we are, and actually i'm sitting here and i'm going okay so um do i have a where's my duct tape because my head's going to explode about any second now. <laughs> right. yeah yeah <laughs> The, <laughs> we started getting going a little bit there. I started kind of feeling the excitement, you know, and uh, yeah. I, I, uh, but I think, yeah, it's a good, this is, uh, this is a, probably a good place to, to tone it down, but there's definitely, um, there's definitely more conversations to be had. And thank you, Christine, for being the person who kind of anchored and pulled people in together and made a space for this unique conversation, whatever we call it, whenever we meet again, it's, you know, it's kind of an awesome place. It's definitely awesome. It feels good. <laughs>